what was I saying before I tried to flex like a little shit fuck? Um. No thoughts, head empty. I hope real teachers don't watch this. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ashley, and you probably saw the title of this video, which is how to write an A plus 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 essay in high school in your first year of college. I just finished my sophomore year. I've only so far taken maybe five English classes at Columbia University. I'm going to tell you how to ace essay writing, how to make it easy, streamlined, but how to still improve your skills and develop your own voice, your own style, and create a finished product that not only will you get a good grade but you're proud of you feel like you learned a lot from so if you're someone who wants to tackle the challenge of writing a great essay first we're going to talk about steps that anyone at any level can take to write a better essay and then we're going to talk about peer review and the practice of constructive criticism and then we're going to talk about what you can do to overachieve to get that a plus mark how i see essays are as a way for you to enter a conversation without feeling like you don't have the resources or the evidence or the quotes to back yourself up you're able to understand a literary and academic conversation through different angles, literary techniques, word choices, devices, etc. Surefire things that you always need to do that are like the simplest ways to get points docked. Write your name, write your professor's name, write the date, write a title, have it in the right size, number your pages, use AP, NLA, whatever style format they want. Make sure the grammar is right, use Grammarly. Make sure that your essay at least looks put together. No spelling mistakes, stuff like that, easy stuff. Let's not get ahead of ourselves because we need some foundational things. One of the simplest things you can do that I see as just as important as understanding the prompt is understanding who your teacher is and what they want from you. So in high school, you might think this is a little hard. Let's say you're in a public high school. The students are like, well, you know, we don't have really office hour settings, but there is still a way to get to know your teacher. Sometimes they will provide example essays. If they're providing example essays, that means that that's exactly what they want. If there's a specific topic or passage that they're really dwelling on in class, you can think, well, what is a parallel argument or not the same argument, but a partner argument that I could be making. Also, a lot of times in syllabi, teachers sometimes outline what they want. And that can really be said through something like the class mission statement. You're trying to write an essay that demonstrates that you understand the materials in the class, you understand what the class is about, and you want to further your knowledge. Now, it isn't a mere reiteration, and sometimes the mission statements are super abstract, but it's a way of bringing an argument forward and finding a place to start. Now, what's the most helpful and what a lot of kids are against is going to office hours, but the beautiful thing about office hours is that you're investing 10, 20 minutes of your time and you are getting hours out of it. One thing that you can do is you can suggest topic ideas. Look at their immediate reaction. I know I'm onto a good lead if it really sparks my teacher's interest. They're automatically like, oh, have you read the passage on page 123? Have you thought about this? This is how you could destabilize it. I'm really curious about this. And you should follow that lead. Teachers are so different. Have teachers who are like, oh, instructions. Let's talk about how we feel. So then you know that you have the space to create a big picture argument. But I also had a teacher who was like narrower. We can't be talking about family dynamics. That's too big of a topic. We can't be talking about this one mother and her daughter. That's too big. Literally my final essay, which was about 10 pages long, was literally about fingernails and what they meant and what the fingers on the hands did. It was just basically that. How long were the fingernails? What was that an indication of? But never bringing it to a big picture thing. Like, oh, fingernails were a sign of agency. No, too big picture. Number two is do not stop start with an idea. You just finished a book and now you're like, this book is about XYZ. That's a terrible way to go about it because that is based on maybe your own preconceived notions that had nothing to do with the book. It's too big picture to start with something 
so large and then narrow in. What you have to do is you have to start small and work your way up. So you have to locate one passage, one word, one sentence, one interaction between two people. You have to really reread it, reconsider it, reconsider it in the context of other things, in the context of the novel. You don't start with an idea, you start with a passage and that creates the idea. Tip three, get rid of your notion of structure. We all start, you know, at least for me, I was introduced to essays in first or second grade through the conventional hamburger model. We are taught introduction, paragraph, 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 conclusion. But what this really does is it tells you that if you have three paragraphs, you can only dwell on a topic one third of the time. That's not true. I think the hamburger model is a good place to start, but it doesn't allow you to really be curious, to really explore. You want to be complicating it. So obviously everything does tie back to the introduction, but it's not like, oh, point one is saying this, point two is saying this. The order of the paragraphs themselves matter. You shouldn't be able to just shuffle paragraph two and three. You shouldn't be able to just switch it. Paragraph one complicates the thesis. Paragraph two complicates the complication of the thesis. Something where they're all working in tandem or they're working against each other. It's, it's less like this and it's more like you're following a path and you have to take it the way that feels like it has literary integrity and where you're not just pulling things out of your ass it's where the argument cohesively and logically follows and you're really trying to understand what's at the core of something to understand everything else point number four how do I develop a thesis that's a great question especially when I hand wrote essays I felt like I had to know the thesis knowing the thesis beforehand has a degree of confidence which you have to be willing to also chuck out the window. Anytime I started and actually wrote a thesis, sometimes it was great to know where the immediate argument was going, but by the end, I would completely revise the thesis. The entire point of writing the essay, of brainstorming, is to keep moving forward, to not repeat yourself. Ask yourself, what more is there? I understand this through a psychological perspective. How can I now understand through the perspective of literary devices? Something like that. And so by the end of the essay is where I would really recommend writing your thesis because you know where it starts, you know where it ends. As opposed to, I think sometimes people give away the entire essay, but you can discuss how the initial argument can be complicated and challenged in a way that gets the reader's brain also working and primed for where the essay is ultimately supposed to end up. Number five is stakes. I don't mean this as the culinary wonder that costs like $30 a plate, but it is, oh my gosh, am I really gonna do this much? It really is the meat of the essay. It's it's why the reader cares. Why does something matter to me? Why does something matter to the reader? Why would something matter within a larger academic discourse? A lot of students, and especially myself, when I first started writing academic essays seriously or at the college level, that I thought stakes had to be huge. The thing about stakes is that you cannot make it too large and too abstract, age old concepts that people have really tackled and struggled with, that's not really going to work because it just seems like a cop out. Your essay, you need to give it more credit than that. It needs to be slightly more solvable. It can be a stake that applies to a very niche set of the population. So this is less big picture advice. And this is more, if you're having trouble getting started, this is a surefire way to get your brain going and ensure your own success. That is to have a digital version and control F words. Now, most people often stop way too early in this process. For instance, they will be like, oh, the word mother is used 62 times. Let's unpack that. You need to first find a word that really matters and is strange. My personal encounter is like, if you find a word that's like, why is this being used? Like the carpeted freedom. This is so random, but like, let's say someone says the carpeted freedom. You're like, why is it carpeted, okay? And then you don't just stop there, like, oh, the word carpet is used three times. Okay, well, 
the word curtain is used, the word painting is used, very domestic things to describe national independence. That's weird. It just gets your brain going and then it's not just like one word, but it's a whole subset and genre of a word. It's a whole way of paying attention to language. So my next tip is you have to be in pain. If you are not frustrated and in pain, and I mean this through one actual concrete value, which is time. If you haven't paid this essay, especially something like a personal statement or a final paper excruciating amounts of pain sometimes you can get a good grade but it's not going to feel good or rewarding words at least for me and a lot of people are pretty easy to produce you can type 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 but to produce a beautiful cohesive complicated yet almost breathtakingly simple and it feels short because of how well it's Thread it together essay is so hard to do. And this is really how to approach the pain of a second draft. People will tell you this everywhere. Okay, for me, a five page first draft takes me five hours. I can submit that and I can get a 90%. But if I want to get a 98% or something in this class, I'm going to need another five hours. The part that really hurts is that it's still five pages. You're not even getting your mind on a different topic you're just dwelling. It's all about being there and especially after constructive criticism. Usually if even yourself, if something is like sparking interest and you're just moving away from it so that you can create something else in your essay, no, you need to make room for that one thing. And so a lot of revision is getting rid of what isn't working and really complicating and drawing out and explaining and explaining from different angles the part of your essay that is working. Those are my seven tips for writing a good essay. A good essay meaning the essay is not completely going over your head. You listen to your teacher if you are trying to complicate the structure and starting with something small and creating something big. That's going to get you an essay that at least follows the prompt, at least gets you thinking about things. But now I'm gonna talk about things that really push it above and beyond. And the first thing that I see as a necessity, and I almost never did this in high school, was peer review. Peer review the shit out of your essay. I think that a lot of people don't approach this because they feel a little bit scared and timid because sometimes they don't trust other people's advice. And that's fine. I took a class by this guy right here, Aaron Ritzenberg. One of the things that we always had to do is we had to get peer reviewed about four times. His way of combating traditional anger and angst about peer review is that he said peer reviewing is not about giving advice. If you personally would not choose that sentence, it's not really about that because they're their writer, this is their style, and you can't say, hey, this is wrong, this is right. He said that what you should do is explain to the writer of the piece as you're reading it what you're feeling. The first paragraph left me feeling confused. The second one had me feeling excited. The third one had me feeling enlightened. Oh, you know, this didn't make sense with this. This was such a blanket statement. I don't know where it came from. It's more this is how I feel. If it's a persuasive essay and you're getting lots of feedback, like I felt persuaded, then great, then you're doing your job. But if you're hearing a lot of, I feel confused, where did this come from? Who is your source? Why did you choose the source? I'm curious why they chose the source or why they chose this passage. Those are really helpful. As the author of the essay, you're like, well, you're, I'm supposed to be establishing confusion. I want you to feel this sentimental nature, even though it's an academic essay. You're really able to track, am I achieving the effect that I want to achieve? Usually a good essay makes people feel a lot of things that aren't necessarily that personal, but feel a lot in terms of their mind. Oh, this is interesting. You're pulling from this. That's unexpected. Things like that. Now we're going to talk to my A plus bitches, which is how do I get a stellar LR essay? I don't even think that professors or other people really reward you for this or understand it on like a cognitive level, but a huge place where stakes can be created and explored in a fun, whimsical way is through a title. Titles for me really help me set up the idea of stakes. There can be a pun in it. If you're able to use language through a title to create something that sort of rips someone in, like think about a YouTube video. It's the thumbnail and it's the title. It's a way of understanding that your essay can be consolidated to something very interesting and very quirky and refreshing and a new, even though maybe you're talking about Pride and Prejudice or something really old, it's a new and modern take that is even modern in the way that you're utilizing language 
through a title. For me, it's my most favorite part because it's really the place I get to be like, what is this essay about? Add some alliteration, add a colon, titles are fun. My second tip for a stellar essay is you want to do something that other people aren't doing. Some kids take this the wrong way. They're like, oh, I wanna argue that racism doesn't exist. They take it on like an almost an opinion level. I think that having controversial opinions are fine if they're your real opinions, but don't just do that for the shock factor. What I say by writing something unconventional is that you wanna pick an unconventional topic, for instance, the past essay, the last past essay I wrote, I was like, I've read Pride and Prejudice so many times. I've thought about it so many times. I don't want to write this essay. But that's because Pride and Prejudice, you think of it as a love story. But I was like, well, you know, who in this story or what in this story is very unexplored? And maybe it's, it's explored in like a very academic field, which it has. And I found through my research, it has. But in a 30 person seminar or something, not everyone is like, oh, I'm going to recategorize and really think about servants and Labor. So my third piece of advice is to delete buzzwords, delete abstractions, delete complicated jargon that you are like, oh, I'm in the eighth grade. I learned the word perfunctory. We're going to use it in every sentence. Oh, I learned the word dogmatic. You learn these words and that's great. I learned the word like epistolary and I was like epistolary, epistolary, and it's fine. It's fine to want to be curious about those words and understand how they work in a sentence. But I think at the essay level, if you can really get rid of all the words that create like really loud noise, poetics, aesthetics, stuff like that. Huge words that are tied to culture and literary traditions and whatever. You get rid of that noise and you really go back and you reconsider what is the word that best fits. I know this word and I know eight synonyms for it. And out of those eight synonyms, what is the best words with the best connotations? And me personally, as a creative writer, the ones with, that can create a little bit of spunky alliteration or a little bit of assonance or consonance or, you know, a little bit of like pop even to like the sentence itself, what is truly the best word and not just the buzzword or the words that makes me feel intellectual. As opposed to using language as a way to flash, you have to use it as a way to facilitate. But my personal favorite thing to do that I do probably in half of the essays I write is I find my favorite book and my favorite passage and instead of praising the shit out of it, I think about what does it lack. And sometimes you find out, you know what, it is lacking a greater social awareness in the category of but sometimes you know what there's a sub subtle subversive way that this author actually did answer my question and did punk me i'm using jargon now <laughs> What this is trying to create is a level of like awareness. It's a level of approaching a text with caution and precaution, as opposed to being like, how do I prove what I already think? Instead, you're gonna think, how do I prove something I don't think? Or how do I unprove something I think? Juxtapose your levels of trust and intimacy collections of essays that were really foundational to my understanding of what essays could be as a high school student were these two books. I'll talk about them a little bit. These books really show to me that you can break convention, you can break style, and you can still be Toni Morrison. This was a book of essays and speeches collected after Toni Morrison passed away. Another thing where she sort of does it almost academic styled essay, but it's a lot more loose and free than a typical essay is the forewords to her own novels are essays. The other set of essays is by Hanif Abdurraqib. And typically when you think about a school essay, you, know, you think of something about an old book that you're like, why is this on the syllabus? Why why this still matters to us? Um, but this is just this dude talking about why he loves rappers and Carly Rae Jepsen, but it sort of interweaves into his own narratives about race relations, grief growing up, his college experience, his experiences with love, and the loss of friendship, etc. So this is also a beautiful book. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's video. Please like it, subscribe, let me know anything you would like to see in your future, any questions, curiosities that you had, and I really enjoyed making today's video, They're reflecting on my own educational experience and giving it to you for free. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you learned a lot.